Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Hello, I'm Chef John Foltz. Food is so much more than nutrition here in the South. Every weekend on Louisiana's Back Roads and Bayous, our festivals celebrate the food, music, and cultures that make us unique. Why not join me as we visit the fairs and festivals of our state and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. In 1778, King Charles III of Spain established five protective settlements around the city of New Orleans after learning that the British were coming back to claim the mouth of the river. These five areas, the most famous being Barataria and St. Bernard, were settled by the Canary Islanders because first of all they were Spanish and second because of their close proximity to the New World. The mission was accomplished. The British were defeated at the Battle of New Orleans. Each spring, there's a festival held commemorating the efforts of the Canary Islanders. Welcome to St. Bernard and to the Los Islenios Festival. The first group of Canary Islanders arrived here in 1779 and established settlements along Bayou Terra Berth, an abandoned channel of the Mississippi River. They were expert boat builders and the most knowledgeable shrimp and oyster fishermen on the Gulf of Mexico. Captain Charles Robin is a great example of the Los Islenios culture in Louisiana. This colorful society brought with them to Bayou Country the famous Tenerife Lakes, thought to have its origin in the Middle Ages. It arrived here from Tenerife, one of the islands in the Canary Chain. The lace is called Spanish Sun because of its radial threads and recalls the fine tracery of a spider's web. Their most famous dish, caldo, is a vegetable soup made with beans, corn, and potatoes, and always finished with cabbage and a little bit smoked meats. This cultural and food festival is held on the grounds of the Ducros Museum in the village of St. Bernard and is a unit of the Jolifite National Park near Chalmette. Food is a central theme of the festival and visitors can enjoy dishes ranging from cornmeal fried oysters to gumbo and of course, a bowl of spectacular tasting caldo. After a bite to eat, you may wish to lay out on a blanket under one of those oak trees and enjoy the music of Cesar and Julio. Wow, what a sound. After listening to the music, I enjoyed watching another of the Robin clan at his craft. Most of these early pierogs were painted green to match the swamp, and naturally, I had to add my expertise to the finish. There are many demonstrations taking place throughout the festival grounds, and most are historical in nature. Here, Dickie Churn portrays Dr. Alfred Ducros in front of the Ducros Museum. All of his early medical tools and medicines are on display, including the family muzzle loader that was used for hunting and protection. Over on the porch of the house, a flamenco dancer entertains the crowd with some of the fanciest footwork you'll ever see in South Louisiana. One of the things I love most about living in this state is discovering the diversity of its people, and this fact is so evident here in the marshes of Bayou Country. What a day we spent here in St. Bernard experiencing the last bastion of Spanish colonial culture in Louisiana. For over 200 years, this closely knit group of people who call themselves Islenios has maintained a traditional lifestyle of days gone by. I do hope that you'll be able to take the time to venture to St. Bernard Parish and join me next spring as we celebrate the Los Islenios Festival. Los Isleño, what a cultural festival down in St. Bernard Parish. You have to get off of the highways and byways and come down and spend a day at this festival. You know, one of the things that really impressed me about this particular cultural festival is that often you think of coming together on a weekend and going to search out one of these 
fairs and festivals of Louisiana or your own state, and you think of music, you think of uh, oh, some food, possibly an ice chest, a cold beer, nothing wrong with that, but at these festivals, and especially this one, a real love of culture. It's all about preserving culture, heritage, all of the different things that's so important to people today. We want to relive our past, but we certainly want to know where did we come from to understand where are we going. And to me, that's the most important thing about festivals such as the Los Isleño Festival. Very, very important in retaining the culture of a people that came here many years ago to protect the city of New Orleans when the Spanish took control from the French. They thought the English were coming back and they were gonna do something about it. So very important that we retain all of these cultures, but more important that you come to Louisiana or if you're from Louisiana, get in that car and head out to St. Bernard and be a part of one of the greatest cultural and food festivals in all of the South. My guest in the kitchen today is Debbie Carballo, and Debbie is not only from Los Isleño culture, but at the same time, she knows a lot about preserving the heritage, a lot about cooking the foods, and she even went back with her kids to Spain, her, uh, and her husband, of course, and lived there to learn the language and experience all of the uh, uh, the history of the Spanish people so they could come back and really enjoy the life of being Spanish in Louisiana. So she's going to be in the kitchen just a little bit later and we're going to talk about those foods. But let's talk about foods that I'm going to cook today. Look down on this great big old platter. This is the ingredients of that caldo that we were talking about just a minute ago. All of the wonderful things that go into the pot of the Spanish soup. We have here the beans. Of course, the white beans are navy beans or very important in this particular dish because not, not only does it thicken it, it gives it part, part of its flavor. I've soaked them overnight and it makes it a lot ten, more tender. Of course, the meats. We have pickle meat, uh, smoked sausage, we have ham, we have all kind of wonderful smoked meats. Of course, everybody does their own thing. So it, it, any imaginable amount of meat could go into the pot. Here's squash, yellow squash, zucchini squash together. Green beans, sweet potatoes, peas, corn, very important, and greens. This is spinach, but mustard green, and of course, uh, uh, cabbage always finishes the dish along with potatoes and this wonderful little vegetable. This is melitone, or chayote squash, as most of you may know it if you live around the country. In Louisiana, we call it melitone, and it was brought over by the Canary Islanders as they came to New Orleans, and this today is one of the most important vegetables in all of Louisiana cooking, and it also goes into many of the caldo pots. So here in my cast iron pot, I have a little chicken stock going because you always start this dish with some stock and of course many of the uh, 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 Islanders will always take a chicken and boil it overnight and uh, uh, or at least boil it the day before so that they can take that nice chicken meat but retain the stock. It's very important for that good flavor of the soup. And then the chicken often goes back into it. But I'm going to begin this one the way Debbie told me I had to do it. I'm gonna put the pickle meat and the smoked meats and sausages down into it along with the beans. And of course, remember, uh, always put into these pots what you're gonna like. Put some of those smoked hocks if you want to because uh, smoked meats is also a very important part. Uh, smoked ham hocks is a very important part of this dish. Now, the white beans, navy beans, great northern beans. Go ahead and put them in the pot. And as I say, if you soak them overnight, uh, they're going to cook in about half the time, but you want to definitely get those beans really nice and tender. Now, you want to bring the water to a boil, and once it boils and the beans tenderize in about an hour or so or start to get tender, then you can begin to add your other vegetables, because if you add your other vegetables too soon, obviously they're just going to cook apart. Also, you want the smoked meats to flavor the broth. You have a chicken stock, but the smoked meats will instantly start to put that wonderful smoked flavor into this pot, and the beans will pick that up, the beans will start to tenderize and thicken the dish, and you have a wonderful soup. Is this not maybe the origin of vegetable soup in Louisiana? I don't know. Now, we're gonna go in with the squash. I'm gonna put a couple big handfuls, assuming that this is cooked now for a couple of hours, an hour and a half, and the beans are nice and tender. Now, I'm gonna go in with my squash, my green beans, I'm gonna put them down in here, my uh, sweet potatoes, which will give it a really nice not only color, but at the same time, sweet flavor, uh, corn. And I always take my corn, by the way, and cut it in little cabets like this, so it kind of floats around and really gives a nice uh, look to it. Use uh, canned vegetables if you're in a rush, 
uh, the fresh vegetables are always so much better. Potato, naturally, you want to put that in. You can see how pretty this dish begins to look once all of the flavor and ingredients are added to the pot. Now, you want to kind of stir this around a little bit. And as I say, assuming now that these vegetables are going in, the beans have cooked for about an hour and a half, now you're going to cook it until these vegetables, fresh vegetables, start to get tender. Just a couple of minutes. It won't take very long at all. And of course, uh, you can season it any way you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and put some onion, celery, bell pepper. Just kind of throw all of that in. You might want to throw it in with the when you put the beans in as well. Go ahead and add those flavors because this gives it that Louisiana uh, look, even though it came over uh, with the Spanish. Go ahead and put the um, bell peppers in, yellow and red, of course, very Spanish. These peppers came over from Spain and the island, so we definitely want to put that color in here. Look how pretty that pot is. You got to get a shot down in there, how nice it is. Garlic, throw some of that in. And to finish the dish, let's say that this is cooked now for, oh, I don't know, let's say about two and a half hours or so, and all of these beans are cooked, the smoked meats are wonderful. I'm going to put a little salt and pepper in, some hot sauce in it, some Creole seasonings if you want to, just throw some of your own favorite spices into it. And then you're going to add your greens and cabbage. I'm going to put some spinach, some mustard, some collards, all of those nice greens. The great thing about this soup is that everybody has a different recipe for it. So let this go into the pot. Uh, continue to cook it until all of the seasonings are perfectly done, nice and tender. And then you want to go ahead and serve it. You can serve it over rice. And I want to show you what this looks like when it's all said and done. When this pot is uh, cooled down and you're ready to put it, put it away, it freezes so well. To put it in the freezer and let it uh, sit around for a couple of months and bring it out when friends come over. Take a look at this caldo and this nice terrine. Look at that. Can you imagine how pretty that is? All the vegetables are cooked. And talk about healthy. Of course, if you want to leave out some of the fats and smoked meats, go ahead. It's one of the healthiest dishes you will ever eat. Caldo from the Los Isleño culture of New Orleans. Now, what is the next dish most associated with the culture? Well, one of the dishes that most associated with Louisiana is, of course, jambalaya. And we know that jambalaya came from the Spanish paella. But I want you to take a look at this platter because this is the Louisiana version of paella that originated in Valencia many years ago. We have all the different meats again. When you make paella, it's the great rice dish that's seasoned with, this is the uh, Cajun French sausage, chorizo, which has uh, pork and green onions, garlic, chorizo, very nice. This is chorizo, the Spanish ground sausage with the paprika, and of course, more sausages, the real heavy smoked sausage from Louisiana. We're going to put tomatoes and, of course, crawfish. Naturally, clams, mussels, lobster, all of those things could have gone into the dish. But much more importantly, in Louisiana, all of these great seafoods would go into the pot of the Spanish in New Orleans. So to begin, my little paella, my little uh, Cajun Creole Los Isleño paella, I want to go ahead into the pot with a little oil. And then I'm going to put in my onion, celery, bell pepper. Again, you want to add all of these wonderful flavors. Remember, this dish originated in Valencia, Spain, but boy, did it, does it have variations around the world, millions of variations. Colored bell pepper again, a lot of colored pepper. Put that around the pot. And then, of course, garlic. You always want to have uh, a touch of garlic in here. Not a whole lot of spice, but a touch of garlic. Simmer that around for just a minute. And then, of course, the smoked meats. You want to put all of those great smoked meats into the pot, and I can't tell you how many variations of this dish exist around the world. I'm going to put in the smoked sausage, and I'm going to put in the chorizo, the Spanish version of the meat. I'm going to just go ahead and chop that into the pot and start to add that wonderful flavor. And of course, you can imagine what the sausage is going to do to this pot, give it that wonderful smoke as well as the spice, because there's garlic and pepper in here. And once that's in, then of course I can add my tomato and crawfish. I'm going to add about, oh, two good handsfuls of fresh crawfish tails. And you can imagine that the Islanos would have very quickly found and adopted crawfish to the dishes because they were everywhere in Louisiana, especially around St. Bernard, and they were a fishing people. So naturally, they would have gone out to search out the foods of the bayous. 
Once that's all in, you can season again, salt, pepper. I always like to tell people, add whatever you want to the pots. Don't use all of my flavors. Just put whatever you like. That's what's going to make it interesting for you and your family. It's naturally the dishes that you want. I'm going to add a little tomato sauce to this because it's got to have that great red color. By the way, you can add tomato sauce to the caldo, too, if you want to. Give it that nice red look, and a lot of people do. And then the stock. I'm going to add a nice shellfish or crawfish stock to it. Very important to keep that nice red flavor, red look, tomato flavor. And remember, for rice, about one and a half parts of stock to one part of rice. That's always the measurement, one and a half to one. Go ahead and put some green onions and parsley in here right now to give it that nice look. Bring this to a rolling boil, and then you go ahead and add the rice to it. I always put my rice in uh, right after all of the seasonings have come together nicely. And then, of course, you want to cover this. Bring it to that boil. Let all those flavors marry. And you want to cook it for about, oh, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of probably... Uh, 45 minutes to an hour, 30 minutes the rice will be cooked. Turn the fire off and just let it sit here and steam and get all of that great flavor into the rice and it'll be nice and tender. And I have to show you what it looks like. Take a look at this beautiful big platter of Los Isleño paella. Isn't this beautiful with the crawfish all on the top of it? Of course you can throw the crawfish right into the pot. Uh, too. Now, there's a couple other dishes that I have to show you, dishes that I discovered at the Los Isleño Festival. The first is our little gumbo. We have a little uh, uh, duck and smoked sausage gumbo, and I'm going to put a little filet into it. Wild duck, remember, they're in the swamplands of South Louisiana, so gumbo would have been an important part. And that's filet powder, the ground leaves of the sassafras tree. Gives it a great flavor. And the next dish is very important. I wanted you to come back to the stove because you have to take a look at this pot. This is a boiled pudding, and this pudding in this blue pot is a batter of flour and raisins and pecans all wrapped in cheesecloth and simmered at 190 degrees. And I want to show you what this looks like when it comes out of the pot and allowed to sit overnight in the refrigerator. Take a look at this beautiful platter of the boiled pudding. If you can see this, I'm going to add a little bit of the creme anglaise, right on top of that boiled pudding. It has pecans and raisins, all these wonderful nutmegs, cinnamon. Great, great flavors, but I can think of no pudding, and very old, too. This dish goes back so many years, a lot of people forgot about it, but it is wonderful. So that's the two dishes that I wanted to show you. Now, I told you about my good buddy, Debbie Carballo, who is going to come into the kitchen and talk a little bit about the Los Isleño culture in Louisiana. Hey, Hello, how are you John? doing? Fine. Nice to see you. You look beautiful in that red. Huh? Thank you, Spanish. Is that Spanish? Red. <laughs> that's, that's right. Brought you a beautiful plate. I know you have a collection on a recent trip to Spain. I brought you this beautifully painted, oh, hand painted this, painted this is really gorgeous, and it kind of looks like that Tenerife lace that we saw a while ago with the, Absolutely. With the, the sun, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. and the scalloped edges. It is much. really beautiful. What did you bring me, a set of 12, 15, 20? Well, <laughs> on my future trips, I'll, I'll I buy th you I some. thank you so much, because You're I love welcome. China, as You're you know. You, we talk about Tenerife lace, and certainly this has the look of the Tenerife lace, but it is so famous in your culture. I want everybody to take a look at it. Tell me what we're looking at right here. All right, this lace is uh, the ten Tenerife lace, which is made on a base with pins sewn with needle and thread. A little different uh, style than what's done in other laces. And uh, very, very Spanish. We've resurrected it recently. It does look like a spider web when you think about it. And this is something right. that, because of y'all festival, this is still living on in New Orleans today uh, in St. Bernard. Look, this is another uh, style, huh? Yes, a different style. Now, this would have been used on clothes as well as decorative. Right, decorative on tables. Uh, yeah. Beautiful, furniture. beautiful lace, Tenerife lace. Now look, I, you, you have to help me with a dish here very quickly because I talked She's about chayote squash on Melitone, and this is one of the most important vegetables that the uh, Los Isleño culture brought to Louisiana. So I want you to stir my sugar and eggs. We're going to make a Melitone, or chayote squash pudding. We're going to uh, just stir the eggs and sugar around to blend them well. And while uh, Debbie's breaking that up, I'm going to add the boiled Melitone. Melitone looks just like squash once it's 
boiled and, and cooked, so you want to blend that in really nice. And then I'm going to add a little milk to it. You want to bake this just like you do bread pudding. Uh, just kind of add all of those flavors in. And then cinnamon, a little touch of nutmeg and vanilla. Just exactly like you would uh, any type of a uh, bread or squash pudding, a little vanilla in there. Of course, you can add uh, some uh, brandy or a little uh, mm. uh, liqueur to really That's flavor it some. And now, of course, I can just sprinkle in the flour. And you're going to make just, uh, this will thicken up the batter a little bit. Just kind of blend that in. And this would go into about a 350 degree oven. And this pudding would cook for somewhere in the neighborhood of, I guess, about uh, 30, 35 minutes. And I have some already done here. I want you to take a good look at that at that platter of the pudding right here in front of you because that is really a nice dish. Beautiful, and beautiful. And sit down right here, Debbie, and let's talk a little bit sure. about the Los Isleno uh, culture. You know, when I think of people coming to America, especially our early settlers, I think of people who were displaced or people who were looking to escape persecution, but not so with the uh, Isleno. No, we were settlers. Our ancestors came from Spain to settle Louisiana. There were military people who brought their families over with them to protect the Spanish settlement. But because as I say, I guess Spain had just taken over the city and they were determined to keep it. They didn't want anybody taking it from That's them. That's right. They were afraid of English aggression and uh, they were here to protect their settlement. Right. Uh, now, who, who are they today? When I think of the, uh, uh, of the islanders, I think of... Uh, of a very colorful and certainly a very interesting group, but who are mm -hmm. they today in New Orleans? Today, these are the people who are shrimpers, they're uh -huh. some trappers, uh, they're the doctors and lawyers, the people who have kept their heritage alive. So, so they're, they're just uh, assimilated really uh, uh, well into the American culture, just like the rest of us. Right, uh, right. Uh, but, but you can still find real definite pockets of the Spanish culture there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, you mentioned that they were military uh, 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 people. Obviously, the Battle of New Orleans, which was the last battle of foreign aggression on American soil, took place uh, right there in the city uh, under the command of Andrew Jackson. And the uh, Los Isleño really, uh, really helped out uh, at, with the success of that battle. True, true. That's nearby, near to where they were living. And they did participate in, in protecting the city. Uh, when, when you think of the foods, when I think of Spanish uh, food, I think of things like peppers, I think of the hot little chili mm -hmm. peppers coming from Mexico, but that's not the food of the Islenos. What, no, what, what no. really did they contribute to Louisiana? Well, on the manifest of all the ships, we had something called gofio yeah. that was brought over. Okay, and this what exactly is it? This is a grain. It can be corn. It can be wheat, the mixtures, and they're ground on these gofio stones and it's used to uh, make something like a cornbread that we eat here and also... And it's uh, also sprinkled on top of different it, soups somebody was telling me. It can be sprinkled on caldo, breakfast drinks are made. Uh, mel melitone. Now, melitone. Now everybody yeah. in Louisiana claims that they brought melitone to this state because it's so important to us, but it definitely came from the Canary Islands. Right, right. Was it's it a part very, of the ship's uh, manifest? It was on the manifest, yes, along with the golfio and uh, potatoes, very Spanish. If I was to go into a restaurant today and look up, uh, look on the menu, and I would try to find something that definitely I could say, hey, this is Los Isleño, what would it be? Well, Meliton. Meliton would definitely be. If you find stuffed Meliton, of course, the French influence, Louisiana influence, uh, change that for us, but uh, it's Meliton. It's stuffed, uh, similarly in the Canary Islands also. What about jambalaya? J absolutely. Absolutely. That came from Spain, the paella, and it was adapted with local ingredients here. And uh, jambalaya today is, was the uh, Spanish paella. Well, you know, when I, when I think of, uh, of uh, jambalaya, it's, our, it's, it's the national dish of Louisiana. And again, I mm -hmm. think there's no dispute that that definitely came from the, uh, from the Spanish culture. Uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about with your festival, with your cultural festival, is that it is really uh, in place to preserve the Islamic culture. What exactly uh, is, is, is happening there? What are you all right, doing? That's right, that's right. It's a celebration of our culture, of our heritage. We bring in the, the Spanish dancing, not only the flamenco, but the Canary Island folkloric dancing. We have a lot of people with displays of their crafts wearing the, uh, the typical dress of the day and also the folkloric dress of the Canary Islands. And y'all have a great museum there that has a lot of the artifacts of yes, the early settlers, yes. right? 
gives a history of, of all of the families who came over. Uh, we have lists of the actual boats and, and uh, what families, the names of the families were, were included. Well, great. Well, I tell you, I, I was really impressed with what you're doing there. I think it's a wonderful festival. I will be back next year. And thank you so thank much for coming you. to share thank those you. thoughts with We invite everyone to come and see us. <laughs> Good. And thank you all for stopping by as we continue to visit the fairs and festivals. And make sure that you come back right here as we continue to cook up more of those wonderful, great tastes of Louisiana. We're going to eat paella. Huh? It's nice crawfish. Well, I tell you, this beautiful, pudding looks really nice, huh? Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Folks and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. This is PBS. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $19.95. Chef John Fultz's Louisiana Sampler features recipes and history behind Louisiana's fairs and festivals. The cookbook contains 130 recipes, including those from this show, and over 26 full-color photographs. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen. <laughs>